Okay, hey now everybody, welcome back, brand new Take Game podcast, and this week we have Brian Child on from Baku, e-bikes or electric bikes, and we talk about why e-bikes have risen to such popularity, why they're such a great option, some of them are pretty obvious to me, durability, quiet transportation, dead silent I should say, absolutely no emissions so you're never smelling like gas so many great options with these e-bikes being light versatile storage wise you can go on and on and brian shares all that great info with us but make sure you check out baku electronic bikes it's a great show great products and hope you guys enjoy like always All right, boys and girls, we are live, brand new Take Game podcast, and as always, excited to get a new show out, and this week is no exception. This week, I'm with Brian Childs from Baku Electric Bikes. Brian, how you doing? I'm doing great, Brandon. How are you today? Good, man. It's a pleasure to have you on the show today, and super excited to talk to you about the uh, company you guys have and, and some of the bikes you guys have on the market. And for the past several years, I've been super excited about this kind of technology coming to the hunting side and hunters being able to use it and just, I think it's so stealthy, so smart, and there's a hundred good things that kind of come along with these e-bikes. And you guys have a great looking bike, and I just want to talk today about some of the options you guys offer and, and the ins and outs of how we can use these bikes. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks for having me on today. Absolutely. So I know you guys, we were talking offline and you just told me, but you guys are out in Utah and, you know, you were just telling me, Brian, which I'd like you to kind of repeat that, just kind of how you guys use them out in Utah. It's just amazing. Yeah. So, um, you know, one of our big taglines for Baku is that our bikes are built for hunters by hunters. Um, we use these guys and it, they, uh, Baku really came from a need. Uh, brother-in-law and I were hunting in Idaho uh, back in 2014, archery elk hunting, and it seemed like just about every bull we bugled was uh, two ridges over. And, you know, when you are when you fire up a side-by-side or you try to hook it over there, you're either, you're either making a whole bunch of sound and spooking them off the mountain or else you're stinking by the time you get there. And so we really were just trying to find a way that we could get in on, on these elk um, a little more stealth and a little more scent free and uh, so it just kind of started with us having a need and and looking for uh, a way to do that. I came across electric powered bikes um, overseas and next thing you know found ourselves overseas uh, buying a bunch of protege bikes and brought them back to the U.S. and and those first couple of years it was all about research and development, found a bunch of things that we really liked about them and and a whole bunch of things that we're like, boy, we can improve on this. And uh, that's really where Baku started. It just it gives, a, gives a hunter a competitive edge uh, by being scent-free and being virtually silent moving down the trail. But at the same time, it, it makes you feel good about um, having a far less impact on the environment on just two little fat tires as opposed to a side-by-side or four-wheeler or, or a pickup. So... Uh, kind of the green movement fits right in with those things as well. And um, just lots of advantages from being able to storm uh, throughout the year. They're not taking up a whole bunch of space in your garage. Um, but then, um, you know, at 68, 70 pounds or so, you can you can take them down just about any trail. And um, if you're coming across a lot of deadfall, easy to pick them up and lift them over that, move them around. So just lots of applications and and really just a game changer with regards to the, the hunting world. Yeah, absolutely. To me, it kind of goes, you know, hand in hand with what you just said about being stealthy, but man, you really do leave a much less imprint on the environment in just overall, just not running any gas, combustible, not not leaving, you know, ATV wide or UTV wide tire tracks, and I can't talk today apparently, but uh, <laughs> leaking oil somewhere or cooling if the radiator or a hose bust. But there just seems yeah. to be a lot of benefits to this. But Brian, kind of for those that don't know, let's go over just kind of the ins and outs and the components of a bike and, and how we run it, how we 
how we use it, how we get it to run. And I know you said we you're starting at most bikes are 68 pounds, but let's go through the tires and, and you know the bike itself and all the components and actually how it works. Great. Yeah, you bet. So essentially, um, with Baku, we build our bikes uh, with readily available bicycle components. So uh, when people call us and and they they're saying, "God, I'm trying to decide on an e-bike and and which one should I go with?" I, I tell them, you know, really what what makes an e-bike is is two components. It's a motor and a battery. Outside of that, it's a fat tire mountain bike. Um, its upgraded components uh, certainly should have upgraded e-bike compatible components because the, the amount of torque and, and power of an electric motor is going to have a far greater impact on, on a drivetrain chain and uh, front chain ring and, and rear cassette and all of that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, it's, it's a fat tire mountain bike. And so... Um, the components of a Baku e-bike are built with readily available components. We use Shimano componentry, so you'll take care of, of one of our bikes just like you would your regular mountain bike um, with regards to uh, keeping the chain clean, keeping the, the rear cassette clean, keeping it free of debris and dust, those little uh, rock particles that um, over time will actually um, – increase the wear and tear on your chain and your cassette and your and your chain ring. And so typical bike upkeep with regards to, to all of that um, has we, we run air suspension on our front forks and air suspension on our rear suspension of our storm. Um, so, you know, back to we, we don't do a mid-range or a low-end bike. We really are a more of an elite or a high-end fat tire electric hunting bike company. Um, but, yeah, the, the, what sets a, an e-bike apart from a regular mountain bike is a motor and a battery. So I tell customers that's really where you start. Not all e-bikes are created equal. Um, there's Just like there's a difference between a Honda Civic and a Ford Power Stroke, well, there's certainly a difference in electric bikes. And it starts with the motor, uh, just like it does with a car or a pickup. Um, there's essentially two types of motors in electric bikes. There's a mid-drive, which means the motor sits right in the middle of the bike. It works in harmony with the gearing of the bike. Um, mid-drive motors are more expensive um, than, a, than its counterpart, which is a hub-drive bike. A hub-drive motor um, is the, when the motor is placed in the rear wheel or in the front wheel or in both. Um, a hub-drive is, is far less expensive expensive uh, to, to build. Um, hub drives create far less torque than a mid-drive does because it's just raw power that propels you forward, whereas, like I say, a mid-drive bike works in harmony with the gearing of the bike. So any credible um, mountain bike company that builds an electric bike, they're going to use a mid-drive motor. Um, because they create more torque, they're built for off-road use, they're built for climbing, whereas a hub drive bike is far more common in a commuter-type bike um, or in a bike that you would use in rolling hills, but not necessarily in steep inclines. So just to kind of give you an idea, um, our, our ultra motor that is on our Storm and our mule bikes creates 160 newton meters of torque um, and uh, that is the equivalent of about three professional cyclists, um, the power, of, power and torque of three professional cyclists. So you can imagine, you know, we've all watched the Tour de France or some of these, these bike races, and these guys can climb some pretty amazing hills. Well, you take three times that power of these professional cyclists and put it in a motor, and then you put a rider on it that also gets to put a little bit of power into the pedals. And uh, these things... Uh, the, they'll climb anything that you can keep your front tire down on. If you can keep traction, you can climb it. Whereas a hub drive bike creates anywhere from 40 to 60 newton meters of torque. Um, so it's not even half of a mid-drive motor and, um, and therefore is fine for, for you know, rolling hills and flat ground, but as soon as you try to do a steep incline, it just doesn't have that low-end torque to be able to climb. And so that's really where I tell people to start. 
know what kind of motor you're using. Are you using a motor that's a mid-drive or a hub-drive? If it's a hub-drive motor, the bike's going to be far less expensive. You're going to be able to buy a bike in the $1,500 range, but you start getting up into the mid-range, mid-drive bikes, and you're going to be, you know, at least up into the $3,000 range for a lower-end mid-drive motor. And then with mid-drives, um, just like there is with with pickups, you've got gas engines and you've got diesel engines. So you've got a mid-drive motor that, that, that creates a little bit of torque, and then you've got mid-drive motors that create a ton of torque. And so... Um, you're going to want to make sure that you're purchasing uh, or that you know what kind of motor you're getting. Are you getting that diesel engine? Are you getting that gas engine for a mid-drive motor? Um, the ultra motor is, is, like I mentioned, what we run on our Storm and our Mule. And uh, it's the diesel. It's widely recognized as the diesel engine of the mid-drive motor class. creates a ton of torque, but it's also a, a smart motor. Um, it has an integrated torque sensor in it and that torque sensor senses how much pressure the rider is putting on the pedals so that the motor gives you a proportionate amount of power back. And the reason that's so important is if think about riding downhill and having to make a hairpin turn with a big pack on your back. If, you, if your motor doesn't know that you're kind of pushing hard on the pedals or soft on the pedals, it can't gauge how much, how much power to give you back. And if you're coming downhill and have to make a hairpin turn, the last thing you want is that motor giving you a ton of power and throwing you over your handlebars as you're trying to make that hairpin turn. But with a torque sensor, the motor senses, boy, he's backing off the pressure on his pedals. The motor backs off and it allows you to make that hairpin turn. You feel in complete control. You don't feel like the cruise control of your motor is kicking on and off. Um, it just feels very natural to you. But when you need to and you stomp on those pedals, it gives you a ton of power and a ton of torque. And like I say, you can climb anything that you want to climb. So, Brian, let's talk about the battery a little bit and kind of how you guys operate that and, you know, potentially some of the maintenance on it. So I assume that very easy for users to change or swap out. I know they last several years, but I'm just talking, you know, down the road, worst case scenario. If, you know, I'm getting ready for a hunt, I, I notice, hey, this thing's not running right. How e- easy is it to actually change some of those components? Yeah, just simple. Um, with regards to a battery, um, a battery, these long-lasting lithium-ion cell batteries that we put in our bikes uh, will last you five to seven years um, as long as you uh, have, uh, as long as you take care of them and use routine maintenance, which is making sure that you're not letting it sit for extended periods of time, not letting it run down to zero and sit out in the garage in zero degree temperatures. Um, but you'll get five to seven years out of them, and, um, and they're simple to swap out, just like changing the battery in a flashlight. You just... Uh, our bikes come with a key that allow you to unlock the battery housing. You pull one battery out and slap another one in. With regards to changing, a, uh, fixing a chain or something like that, it's just like a regular bicycle. That's another advantage to having the motor in the middle of the bike and not in one of the hubs. If you have a hub motor in the rear hub or the front hub, when you get a, a, a flat tire, um, you have a lot more to work with because the motor is actually in the hub of the, of the wheel. So it's a little more challenging in changing a tire or fixing, a, um, you know, fixing something on the bike with regards to the drivetrain um, in a hub drive motor. But for the most part, it's, uh, it's, it's just a, a typical fat tire mountain bike. Like I say, um, upkeep on the chain and the drivetrain and everything else is exactly like you would do on a regular mountain bike. That's pretty wild. That's amazing to get five, seven years out of something. Talk about low maintenance, you know, and that's one of the great things with these, the options with these bikes is low maintenance to me is key. And if that's all you got to do to cycle that battery and, and keep it running, I mean, geez, that's that's like a dream come true, you know. That's just uh, uh, you're not spending a lot of time on it, which is great, and you can spend time doing other things. But um, 
You know, it just seems like any time you go to use something combustible, you know, the battery's dead, spark plugs are fouled. There's just always something wrong, which we kind of talked about earlier. But, you know, it's just crazy. But it, that, that's an awesome feature for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Now, Brian, I was, I was kind of curious. I know you talked about, you know, like the motor you guys have in like the Storm being like really the top end one. But I kind of want to maybe scale this back to like guys here in the Midwest like me. So I know you guys offer different types of bikes. So would would I be looking at something, let's say for a whitetail hunter, I wanted something more of like the Flatlander. Is that kind of the difference between those types of motors? Because we don't have some of the steep yeah. inclines you guys have. Exactly. Yep, that's exactly right. So we have, uh, we the, the Flatlander is new for 2020. And the reason that uh, we have the Flatlander is because we had a number of, of guys from the Midwest that said, oh, uh, I I don't really ever climb any mountains. Um, I don't I don't need all the power and the torque of this ultra motor, but I love your product. I love the durability of your bikes, um, and and I want all of those components on my bike. I just I kind of feel like I'm buying a diesel engine truck to go get my groceries in. It's just overkill. It's not necessary for me and where I hunt. So yeah, our Flatlander is actually the exact same bike that our mule is, and our mule has been the number one selling fat tire electric hunting bike in the U.S. for just over two years now, and we've uh, just had such great success with the mule. It, it's it's exactly what its name um, would indicate, which is it's a workhorse. It's a it's a bike that, that can pull heavy gear, carry heavy riders, can climb just about anything you dare ride back down creates a ton of torque in that ultra motor and just built for rough, rugged conditions. So we took our mule and essentially the only thing we changed was we took the ultra motor off, the mid the mid drive ultra motor off, and we put a rear hub motor in it. So it's got all the components of the mule, but now it has a motor that as I mentioned before, we can manufacture at a at a cheaper price than we can a mid drive motor. Um, that it works perfect for those guys that live in the Midwest, and that's exactly who we sell them to. We we can we we've taken more pre pre orders on our Flatlander than we ever anticipated, just because the number of guys that are saying, "Wow, I want that mule, all of the components of the mule, but this this hub motor is all that I need." I'm I'm hunting rolling hills and flat ground. It creates 60 newton meters of torque, which is like having a, uh, a professional cyclist and you on that bike. And you can imagine that two guys on a bike, you could, you could create some pretty good power. So I don't want to sh- uh, short end it and make it sound like it can't climb anything. It certainly can, but it just isn't built for the steep incline, rough, rugged terrain that, that the mule is. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I assume you guys were kind of scaling that towards us Midwest guys, but it looks like it, you know, just as you described, it's built the same way. And, I mean, needless to say, you probably know, Brian, we we have some steep hills here. You know, there's some nice buff country and and maybe not anything like the mountains in Utah. But, I mean, there's definitely some stuff here that you need a little horsepower to get through. Yeah, yep, and the, and the Flatlander will certainly do that. Like I say, 60 newton meters of torque. Um, your average professional cyclist would create about 50. So, um, you know, and, and we've seen these guys climb some steep hills before. So that, that motor certainly will climb. It's just not designed to climb this steep, steep, rugged stuff sure. like, like a mid-drive is. But but we wanted it to have all the components of 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 a high-end fat tire hunting bike. Um, that's why it comes with a pannier rack. It comes with the same um, GTMRK uh, front air suspension, comes with a headlight, comes with the mud fenders, comes with the same um, 6061 aircraft aluminum alloy, which is a frame, which is a, a heavy, heavy-duty yet very lightweight frame um, comes with all the same gearing of the mule, so um, you get all the you get all the components that you would want, and then a motor that fits 
fits your budget and also fits the terrain that you're hunting, the application that you're using it for. Yep, absolutely. It looks like it. Now, one thing I kind of wanted to get into, Ryan, is just tell me a little bit of why the tires are, are made the way they are, fat like that. And it looks like you guys, you know, have the same type of tires on each bike, but uh, what does that do for somebody using it, you know, in that outdoor environment? It just gives you stability. Um, you know, when, you, when you're riding on a two-inch uh, tire you, and you get into loose sand or, or you try to ride in um, snow or uh, uh, something that's not hard, uh, compacted um, road, then your tires just feel like they want to wash out on you. Whereas a four-inch fat tire just feels much more stable. It's just more... It, making more contact with the ground. You just feel a lot more stable going down the trail, making turns. It also serves a little bit as some suspension as well. That uh, fat tire has a lot of rubber, and so it rolls over rough, rugged terrain really well and uh, gives you good suspension that way. Um, it also is built to be able to pack some weight, so you can put some heavy riders on these bikes, but you can also you know, way down that rear pannier rack, you can put a trailer on the back and pull a 200-pound trailer behind you. You probably wouldn't want to do that on a skinny little inch-and-a-half or two-inch tire. No, not at all, for sure. Let's talk about that. You just mentioned, Brian, how much weight can a rider, you know, I mean, you got your pack and probably a bow on top of that, and then I noticed you guys have that nice kind of... Aluminum or steel grate over that back tire for some storage. So how much weight can yep. we actually, you know, bear down on that bike safely? We advertise, yeah, we advertise 300 pounds. Um, having said that, the frame will certainly carry uh, in excess of 300 pounds, and we've sold our bikes to guys that are that are over the 300-pound threshold, um, and certainly after they put a pack on and carry some gear. But what happens is you put more and more weight on the bike as you get over that 300-pound threshold, you're just going to have greater impact on the components of the bike, just greater wear and tear on the drivetrain because it's having to carry that kind of a weight. It's under that kind of a load. Um, and so we put, we put a threshold of 300 pounds, but at the same time, I tell guys, if, you're, if you weigh more than that, you certainly... Uh, can can use our bikes and use our products and, and and like I say we've sold several to guys that are over that 300 pound limit. It's just that they're going to be replacing chains and sprockets and cassettes and things a little more often than the guy that weighs 180 pounds. Yeah, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. One thing you, you talked about a second ago too was a you know pulling a trailer. So I, being a whitetail guy, Brian, I got to ask about that. How do how do we uh, hook up some of these trailers, and what's the weight limit on those trailers and, and actually pulling it, like, torque-wise? You know, what, what can we do there with those options? So, yeah, we, we carry three different styles of trailers. We carry a single-wheel trailer that we call our hunting cargo trailer, and then we carry two double-wheel trailers. Uh, one is called the folding cargo trailer, and it simply looks like a cargo-style trailer. And then we have our folding gear trailer, which is a lightweight uh, trailer that essentially is for carrying your game out. And it's really a popular trailer for the whitetail hunters because the nice thing about the folding gear trailer um, is that you can actually use it as a hand cart. It disconnects from the bike, and you can walk it right out to to the area where your game is, load your game up on it, walk it back out to the trail, and then hook it onto the bike. Each one of our trailers um, have a quick, quick release and a quick connection to the to the rear axle of the bike. Takes you less than less than five seconds to pull them on and off. So they they attach uh, to the to the rear hub of the bike, um, which is where you'd want it because you want a low center of gravity, and it allows that trailer to sit level and um, not put a lot of stress and weight on the, on the back end of the bike. Um, but, yeah, so our single-wheel trailer, because it is just a single wheel, we recommend anywhere from 80 to 100 pounds on that single-wheel trailer. And, 
And the biggest reason is because when you've only got the stability of one wheel, when you're turning corners and, and moving, if you've got too much weight, if the weight shifts in that trailer, it has a tendency to kind of pull the bike that direction a little bit. So with the single wheel trailer up to 100 pounds, you're no problems at all. You just balance your weight in that trailer, and it's awesome because it's our most versatile trailer. You can use it on single track trails. You can use it on wide open trails. It fits in the same imprint of the bike. So it's no wider than you are when you're pedaling on that bike, and so it follows right behind you. The other two trailers, you can't necessarily use the double wheel trailers on a single track trail because they're they're popping in and out of that single track and maybe they're too wide to be able to fit in that single track. But at the same time, because they have two wheels, they're they're a lot more stable. So you can put more weight in them and we advertise upwards of two hundred pounds in those trailers. You can easily tow with them and you don't have to worry about so much of the weight shifting in the trailer because you've got the stability of two wheels. Yeah, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense, especially for you guys. I'm sure that your hunting cargo trailer, or the one-wheeled one, really kind of benefits you guys maybe a lot more, uh, you know, compared to us guys in the Midwest where we're, you know, popping off a cattle gate and we can run through, yeah. you know, pasture fields and there isn't really trails per se. So, I, I totally understand the, the need for that one, for sure. So, Ryan, which one, of, I know you guys have tons of so-called accessories and whatnot, that folding deer trailer to me is just like, man, it like kind of makes my mouth water. I would love to have one of those with the bike. But uh, what's one of your favorite accessories that you personally have on, like, your own bike? I would say, uh, well, I, I, I have... Um, one of each of the trailers depending on what I hunt. But one thing that I don't think I would hunt without are the pannier bags. So we have um, pannier bags that, that are built for our pannier rack. They, uh, they're a heavy-duty canvas um, roll-top bag that is waterproof and dustproof. They're a three-clamp system, so they clamp down onto our pannier rack. They hold very stable and very tight to the bike. There's no swinging or movement. Um, but then at the same time, like I say, they're waterproof, so you can you can put your stuff in those bags, your you know your hunting gear and your maybe an extra a pair of uh, maybe your rain gear or another change of clothes or something, and it'll hold things nice and snug and keep them dry. Um, I would say that that's probably 95% of guys that buy a bike with us. If they buy an accessory, they buy the pannier bags. Um, the other nice thing about our pannier bags is that they're a dual-use bag. Uh, your bag comes with a, um, uh, a backpack strap, so you, you can actually throw um, a backpack panel on, on. You can pull your pannier bag off your bike, throw the backpack panel on it, and you can take off up the mountain. It's certainly not, you know, one of your high-end backpacks like you're going to purchase to to haul out an elk with, but it's a it's an awesome day pack, and it's just nice to be able to load your gear up on it, drive back, ride your bike back to a certain spot, and then pull that right off your bike and put it on your back and hike up the mountain without having to transfer stuff back and forth. It's kind of like you just load your stuff up in the morning and then throw it on your back once you get to the end of the trail. Yeah, absolutely. And for those that you maybe are not understanding the idea. Those basically, Brian, you would call like on a motorcycle, they're like saddlebags, correct? Like the pannier bag? Exactly. Yeah. Yep, yep, they're just a saddlebag. Yep, exactly. So let's say you're doing a big backcountry hunt, Brian, in, you know, let's say five to seven days. What are you paying attention to on the bike as far as, you know, like, charging it or needing to charge or, you know, are you ever in jeopardy of it not, you know, for lack of better terms or my knowledge, or not starting or running? And what do you take with you to, like, avoid any issues like that? Well, I we recommend for sure that everybody rides with some of the uh, necessities with regards to tools and maybe a spare tube and, and a, a, a pump and a patch kit. So we recommend that you carry a little trail side repair kit that has maybe 
an extra couple of links or a master link for your chain if you were to break a chain, a few tools that allow you to, to, to pull the wheels off and, and to work on the bike a little bit if you needed to, um, a pump and maybe a patch kit and or an extra tube. Um, those, those are all things that we'd recommend, maybe some chain lube just so that you can kind of keep your uh, chain lubed well. Um, and then and with regards to batteries, you know, we sell a 200-watt a solar panel, um, a 14.5-amp hour battery, which is what comes standard on our mule and our flatlander, um, will charge at home in about four to four and a half hours using a, a 110 system in your home. But it will also charge, depending on a clear view of the sky, on our solar panel in about the same amount of time. So, wow. um, so yeah, so I like to carry, if I'm going to be in the backcountry for, you know, five to seven days and I take a solar panel and I'll take two batteries and I'll, I'll have one battery hooked up to the solar panel during the day when I'm out hunting while I'm using one battery and then I come back and I just swap them out. And so I've always got a full battery. Um, one of the most common questions we get asked is how far can I ride on this bike on a battery? And so there's a lot of variables, just like just sure. like uh, there isn't a vehicle. I mean, when you say, what's your gas mileage? Well, it depends. Am I pulling a trailer behind me? Do I have right. an empty truck bed? Am I going uphill, downhill, or on flat ground? What's the wind resistance like? So there's a lot of variables, but um, we, we spent a couple of weeks in Idaho testing distance and we took a 170 pound rider put him on a mule with a 14.5 amp hour battery during an archery elk hunt and so this is using the bike for what it's intended to be used for going uphill downhill flat ground um, being battery conscientious not just throttling the whole time and not riding on a pedal assist five and for those of you that aren't real familiar with e-bikes and how they work there's Essentially, with our bikes, there's two ways that you can power the bike. There's pedal assist, which means as you're pedaling, the motor assists you. And you can set the amount of assistance it gives you. Level 1 gives you a little bit of assistance. Level 2 gives you a little more. All the way up to a level 5, which gives you a ton of assistance. But if the bike's giving you a ton of assistance, then you're obviously going to be using more battery. And so... Um, if you're riding on a level five all the time, you're going to consume more battery because the motor's doing more of the work. Just like the throttle, if you stop pedaling and you hit the throttle, well, now the motor's doing all of the work. So you're going to use more battery. So in this instance where we were testing distance, we had this rider. We just said, listen, we want you to use it like you're, it's intended to be used. But for the most part, when you're riding on logging roads and flatter ground beyond a level one or two, when you climb a steep incline, use a level five or, or hit the throttle. Um, but let's be battery conscientious. And at the end of our two-week uh, study, he was averaging about two miles per amp hour. So a 14.5 amp hour battery, he was getting about 29 miles on average at 170 pounds. So that's just kind of a ballpark to give guys an idea. Now, if you weigh, if you weigh 230, you're not going to get the same mileage that a guy sure. is that weighs 170 pounds. But at least it kind of gives you an idea. You, right. At 230, you should be up in that 20-mile range if you're being battery conscientious, and you're, but you're hunting on it. If I took that same rider at 170 pounds and I put him on flat ground on smooth pavement and, and no headwind, I mean, he, he's going to be up into the 40, 50, plus mile range um, riding on a level SIS 1 or 2. And so it really depends on what type of terrain you're in and how you're riding the bike. Um, but two batteries for me, I weigh 165 pounds. I can put one on that solar panel and charge it all day. And, and I'm, if I'm riding more than 30 miles in a day, I'm not hunting. I'm just riding. Right. Yeah, that's a lot of riding. So, that's right. Yeah, that's a long ways in a day. Yeah. No, you're right. But, I mean, that's just really good stuff to know for guys that are, you know, kind of gung-ho and maybe get a new bike and, and you don't think through the process, you know, and uh, those are great items to have because you never know when you could get a flat tire and need a pump or tire patch, you know, yeah. all those things are just super important to have. 
Yeah, you know, we've tried to do that. That's that's one of the, the reasons that we say these bikes are built for hunters by hunters. Um, we use them. We're out there testing them and beating them up, and, and we're as hard on these things as anybody that uses our gear um, or more because we want them to perform not just for us, but we want them to perform for our customers. Um, and so that's why every one of our bikes come with a pannier rack because we want you to, we want you to put a, a saddle bag, a pannier bag on the back and, and carry your trail side repair kit and carry the stuff that, that who knows, you know, it's just like anything else, you can have problems with them. And, and so we want you to be prepared um, if, if that time comes that you've got a, a, a way to fix your chain or to fix a flat tire. Um, but we try to we try to build these bikes so that they're built for rough, rugged conditions and that they, they can be dependable. Um, like I said, not all e-bikes are created equal, and we get guys all the time that call us and say, "Well, I bought this this hub drive e-bike and I've been using it for you know six weeks, and man, it's just falling apart on me, and I'm having all these problems." And it's because you know, it starts with components and starts with the motor and starts with the frame. All of these things are built on our bikes for the types of conditions that our guys are going to use them in. Yeah, it sounds like it. And I'm glad you, you know, brought that up today, Brian, about the, the difference. And that was one thing as a guy that has just kind of, you know, started to really look into these e-bikes, that was something I didn't know about. And I can definitely see why the way you guys do yours versus that rear hub or front hub is so much better. Uh, it just makes a lot of sense to me. And it, that, like we talked about earlier, that, you know, coincides with that low maintenance. And I'm just one of those guys, like, I just always want something to work. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's the thing is whether you spend – two grand or you spend five grand, um, that's a lot of money. And, and if it doesn't work, then it did you no good. And right. so it, sometimes you do have to spend just a little bit more to make sure that it fits your needs. You know, when I, when I talk about the difference between a mid drive and a hub drive, in no way am I putting down the hub drives. They're just made, they're made for a different application. Um, we right. have a hub drive bike. It's in our flatlander. And I will we'll stand behind that bike as much as we will our Storm or our Mule or any other bike because um, we've, we've put it out there and said, this is the application for this bike. Hub drive bikes are far more prevalent throughout the world than mid-drive bikes are because majority of e-bike riders are not hunters. The majority of them are commuters. They're, they're people that are commuting to work and, and getting exercise on them. And, and they don't need a diesel engine. They just need something to be able to get back and forth on. And so hub drives are 90-plus percent of the bikes on the market today, and they certainly have a purpose and a role, and, and, and they're, they're just as dependable. They're great motors. They're just, you know, like I say, you wouldn't buy a, you wouldn't buy a Honda Civic to say this is my, my hunting vehicle. This is, this is the, the vehicle I bought to go elk hunting. And, but it's certainly the car that you'd want to commute back and forth to work on. So you just have to make sure that you're buying a bike uh, that fits what you want it to do. Yeah, that's right. No, and, and that's great that you said that, and and great that you guys noticed the difference in between what we do here in the Midwest and what you guys do in Utah, and there's, there's different programs or processes for that as far as these bikes go, and, and you guys built those based on that, and what you've said today in the podcast over and over is you're you're not selling that to a guy that's only it's going to be riding down the street and you know I think people like me other hunters customers appreciate that sort of honesty. Yeah, yeah. I mean that's at the end of the day it comes back to what that customer said to me when we um, when we decided boy we need to start thinking about um, our Flatlander bike. You know, boy I'd sure love to have the mule but it's overkill. I, I, I'm buying that diesel truck to go get my groceries in. And it, and it really is. If you're going to buy our mule or our storm to ride around town, then you're buying the wrong bike. Go go get a commuter bike, get something. Can it? Of course. And do we see guys driving around in big jacked-up pickups, and they probably never take them off-road? Sometimes these trucks look so beautiful, I don't know if they've ever even seen a, a speck of dirt. That's right. But, that, but that's, you know, for us hunters, that's really not what – 
what we're after. That's how they're intended to be used for. And so, yeah, you can ride our bikes out of the grocery store. It's just, it's just built with a lot more power and torque than what you're going to need to go do that with. Yeah, absolutely. Brian, before we hop off here, I got two more quick questions for you, but can uh, you just give me a little bit of info on the warranty and how that works? And then obviously let me know, you know, where everybody can find Baku and, you know, dealer wise, how do they go to process to start shopping? Absolutely. Yeah. So we have a, uh, a one year warranty on motor battery and display. So essentially all the electrical components of the bike comes with a one year warranty. And then, the rest of the bike um, comes with a 30-day warranty, um, and the reason being is everything else on the bike is typical bicycle components, you know, from brake pads to rotors to chains to all of the things that you would have on a typical bicycle. Um, and so uh, a 30-day warranty on that, and then the motor, battery, and frame. Motor, battery, frame, and display is a one-year warranty Um if you're going to have if you're going to have any issues, it's going to be right away with any of the electricals. Uh, we seldom have any problems with our with our motors um, and and displays. I don't know that I've maybe one or two in thousands of bikes I've ever even seen a display have any problems. And then the batteries are pretty straightforward. A battery is a battery with regards to um, lithium ions. We do use a long lasting lithium ion cell, and that's probably something that's worth mentioning too because if there's two things that are the most important on the purchase of an e-bike, it's a motor and a battery. Well, just like mo- all motors aren't created equal, all batteries aren't created equal as well. If you go to the if you go to Walmart or local grocery store and you purchase a nine volt battery, we all know that you can buy one for three bucks or you can buy one for twelve bucks. And sometimes we're we're left standing there at the register thinking, God, well, which one do I buy? There really is a difference in the composition of batteries and some batteries are made to hold a charger for an extended period of time and so we use a long lasting lithium ion cell that is built for backcountry hunting the guys that want to be able to go further on one, on a single charge and so um, so we put a long lasting lithium ion cell battery on our bikes um, so that, that basically is what our warranty is um, and uh, trying to think of oh, and with regards to uh, to finding us, um, www.baku.com. Um, you can find our website. We have um, on our homepage. We have uh, a little um, up in the right hand corner, the top of the page. You'll see contact. And if you go to that contact, you can look up. Uh, you can uh, click on find a dealer. Um, we don't necessarily have dealers in every part of the country, and, and we're certainly working on that. Um, initially, we were uh, a direct-to-consumer company. We didn't set up a lot of uh, dealerships, and so um, just recently we've decided to start branching out and, and bringing on dealers and being a little more aggressive with that. So we realize that we don't have a dealer in every every city, and so we've created something called find an ambassador. And our ambassador page is essentially um, Baku uh, tribe members. So when you buy a bike from us, you become a Baku tribe member. These guys have signed up with us to be ambassadors and said, hey, I'd love to show my bike to anybody that's interested. So if if, uh, somebody, if there's not a dealership in that area, they can look up an ambassador and say, oh, I've got three guys that live fairly close to me that own Baku bikes. There will be a phone number. They can reach out to that ambassador and find a time that they can hook up and they can talk about their bike and they can test ride the bike. And then we give a $200 um, uh, incentive to that ambassador for taking his time to, to show the bike and, and uh, help people around him. Sure. Sounds easy enough. And that's a, that's a really good system as well. So, but, uh, Brian, anything that I leave out or forget, but I, I pretty much tried to answer or ask every question, uh, you know, regarding on how to use the bike, but I think you, you pretty much covered everything. Yeah. You know, it's, um, I, the, the, the thing about, uh, an e-bike is 
is we can talk about it all day long, but until you get on one and you write it, you really can't appreciate what it what it really will do for you. So um, for us at Baku, it's not a matter of us just selling our products or our bikes. We really um, take pride in educating people so that you make an educated decision when you purchase your bike. Whether you purchase a Baku Mule, a Baku Storm, a Baku Flatlander, um, you know, we'd certainly love to have you, but we want you to make an educated decision. And, and uh, so it's all about um, understanding what you're, what you're buying and what your, what your needs are, what your intended use is, and then making an educated purchase. Um, but get out and ride one. Go, go test ride an e-bike. Uh, we call it the e-bike smile. You, you start to pedal it, and within that first 10 yards, that big smile comes across your face because you just can't believe what it feels like when that motor kicks in and all of a sudden you have this pedal assist power and, and your mind starts going to all these places that you could use it in and the fun that you could have riding them um, is just endless. Yeah. I mean, just what you just said, man, just hit the nail on the head. And uh, I, when I think of it, you know, just using those applications for deer hunting, man, it, it makes me smile because I'm just like, man, I can go full stealth engine with these things and I just can't, you know, sometimes stop thinking about the opportunity it possibly could give me as a hunter. So, uh, Brian, man, thanks for your time today and uh, you answered a lot of great questions and, and uh, really got me interested. I'm sure a lot of listeners will be interested because it just seems like it is kind of the wave of the future and like you said, it just uh, really kind of gives us a uh, a little bit of a competitive edge and again thanks for your time absolutely brandon i I appreciate you having me on today and and uh, we'll do it again sometime soon yeah i'd love to so